All right. Since I see that the stream of attendees is, is slowing down a little bit, I suggest we, we get started. So I'd like to welcome every one of you now again to this uh, webinar on the Norwegian Transparency Act that we're hosting today with our partners, Selma Law, um, that are based in Norway. Um, my name is Harold Nitschinger. I'm co-founder managing director of Prewave. We are a software solution that is supporting at this point more than 100 companies with various human rights due diligence legislations, such as the uh, German Supply Chain Act, the Swiss uh, regulation on child labor. And we've been working over the last months together with our legal partners on making our solution also ready for the Norwegian Transparency Act. The uh, act is uh, live since July of last year and the first reporting deadline is, is coming soon. And therefore it's really perfect timing uh, to get into this, into this topic today. And, the focus of this webinar should really be on giving practical and uh, yeah uh, practical strategies and best practices on how an implementation of the law can be realized both in an efficient but of course also in a lawful and compliant manner and for this part we have brought uh, our partners from Selma into this call and uh, they will start by giving an, an overview of the Transparency Act in general and then we will go into the second section, which is the main part of the webinar, where we will focus on the specific legal requirements and highlight some strategies for an efficient and software-based uh, implementation. And we plan to leave room for at least a 10-minute Q&A at the end. Uh, you have a, a Q&A section in your Zoom webinar, where you can also ask questions already while we are speaking. Um, we will then uh, address those questions uh, at the end of the webinar. And also one last uh, administrative note, this webinar is being recorded. We will share the recording afterwards with all attendees, uh, as well as the slides and, and the materials that we are highlighting today. But without further ado, I would like to hand over uh, to my colleagues from Selma Law for first introducing themselves and then going into the first part of our agenda. Nora, Tone, over to you. Thank you very much, Harald. We're very excited to be here and very excited that we can do this webinar on the Norwegian Transparency Act. As you said, the reporting deadline of 1st July is fast approaching and a lot of companies have already gotten started. But what is fantastic about this webinar is that we are now able to talk about how to approach the Norwegian Transparency Act and human rights due diligence with the application of software. And in the end, also target human rights risk and uh, labor risk, which are often embedded deep into the supply chains. My name is uh, Tony Sofonmo. I'm a senior associate here as, at Salmer Law Firm. Salmer Law Firm is the seventh biggest law firm in Norway. We're a corporate law firm. We have a sustainability team that uh, expands throughout all of our departments. And together with me, I have my, my colleague, who is the current lead of our sustainability team. Thank you. My name is um, Nora Maria Eichnes Asplin, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today and to be able to talk about the Transparency Act, which we are quite fond of, I have to say. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> We've been working quite extensively on the Norwegian Transparency Act, also before it entered into force, and it has a historical background, as it has also similarly in other countries. So let's jump into it. Thank you, Harald. The Transparency Act at a glance. Uh, the Transparency Act is what we all... all um, almost dubbed as a Norwegian version of business and human rights. It could have been named uh, the Human Rights Due Diligence Act or the Due Diligence Act, but it has been given the name the Transparency Act. Uh, and why is that? I think in many ways it's because of the emphasis of the need to ensure transparency as a fundamental uh, requisite for ensuring human rights. Mm, and the act requires the companies to have uh, control over their supply chain and their own business to ensure um, compliance with uh, fundamental human rights and decent labor conditions. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the tool for ensuring fundamental respect for human rights, but also 
labor rights and decent working conditions is to conduct human rights diligence. And the Norwegian Transparency Act, it builds upon the international frameworks. It means that the Norwegian Transparency Act, we, we haven't made up a new methodology or a new kind of product, but we build on the international frameworks on business and human rights, deriving from um, the Ruggie principles uh, back in 2011. It means that the same kind of methodology that we find is now being put into legislation in Norway. So you have to carry out this human rights diligence and not only on uh, the supply chain, which we will talk about a lot today, but also your own business. So it encompasses the risk of your own business and the activities that you're doing within your own business, but also throughout your entire supply chain. And as I said, the tool for, for mitigating human rights risk and labor risk is to conduct this kind of human rights due diligence. Mm. And the act is based upon three basic principles. It's the principle of proportionality, meaning that what you do as a company should be proportional with the size of the company and the risk the company faces. And you should also um, have a risk-based approach, meaning that you should focus on where the, ri uh, the risk is the highest. Um, and in addition, it's the transparency principle, which uh, is uh, yeah, visible <laughs> throughout the whole uh, act, I would say. Yeah. Yes, it's a prerequisite of, mm. of the way the Norwegian legislator is viewing business and human rights, meaning that in order to obtain business and human rights, we need transparency. Not only that in a way that civil society, journalists and consumers can hold enterprises responsible, but also in the way that in order to target human rights risk for enterprises, we need to report so that we can learn from each other. And in that way, uh, also such as platforms as PreWave, where you can gather information from multiple sources, is very much aligned with the objective of the Transparency Act. Mm. And the Act, it applies to uh, large companies in our way, meaning public listed companies and companies which um, is quite medium size you can see the yeah definition here on the screen mm -hmm. and uh, prior to implementing this act it was a, a long process and in Norway it was a process that was very much pushed from civil society but also consumers which is why we have this kind of transparency criterions uh, but we also did a lot of assessment of how many companies will actually be affected by this act and if we look at it in comparison to Germany or the EU, the thresholds are pretty low. Mm. Uh, and in order to understand this, we also need to look at the Norwegian market. Uh, the Norwegian market contains of many medium-sized enterprises, which is also why we have this kind of threshold. And it also corresponds with the Norwegian Accounting Act and the definition of larger enterprises. But in the assessment of uh, the Norwegian legislator, they saw that around 8,000 companies would be uh, under the scope of the act uh, when it's implemented. Uh, and they did an assessment on how this would actually impact these companies. And they, of course, concluded that here some kind of work need to be done. Companies need to put in effort. They need to commit to do human rights due diligence. But at the same time, the fact that you are encompassing 8,000 companies and you also have the underlying expectation that all companies follow the international frameworks, mitigate the risk for other companies. Mm -hmm. um, and as we said, the, the basic scope is human rights and, and labor rights. And for the Norwegian Supply uh, Transparency Act, it is a full supply chain. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I can highlight then some, some points, because we have been working quite intensively with customers on the German Supply Chain Act, which has been uh, basically passed at quite a similar time than the Norwegian Transparency Act in 2021, but has been in effect from the 1st of January uh, this year. And um, while there is many similarities, both of course are based on the same fundamental principles, the OECD guidelines, the UNGPs, um, there are some key points of, of deviation. I think one point uh, Tone and Nora already highlighted, that is the the scope of, of, of the companies that are affected by the law, the Norwegian Transparency Act is much broader. The German uh, 
uh, law only applies to companies with more than a thousand employees and that actually only starting next year. Um, so in that sense, it's really much more open to also the, the SME type of businesses. Um, and one other key point of differentiation where the Norwegian law is already much more in line with the upcoming uh, European uh, CS Triple uh, D is the scope uh, on the full supply chain. Uh, in, in the German law, actually only the first tier suppliers are uh, in scope when it comes to regular risk analysis. And you only need to focus on risks at your second or third tier suppliers. We call it tier N uh, suppliers when you become aware, when you have substantial knowledge of issues, and then you need to take action, but only on an, such an ad hoc basis and not on a proactive basis. And this is really a key differentiator where the Norwegian law is already much more in line uh, with the, the European law that's, that's also coming up. Um, if I can just add two, two points, just adding on what you just said now, Harald, because it's very two crucial points to be made on the Norwegian Transparency Act and what we are now seeing the, the implications of this act entering into first force. The first one is, of course, the scope of the act. It covers Norwegian enterprises, but we also think that a lot of participants maybe are global enterprises. And if you are, have Norwegian activities and if you're tax liable to Norway, you will fall within the scope of the act, but it will be limited to the subsidiary. Mm. What we are, however, seeing is that these forms of, of, of legislation, even though the scope of the act is clearly defined, it has broader implications. And that is very clear from the Norwegian Transparency Act due to the fact that the reach is the full supply chain. It means that if you have a Norwegian customer, it can ask um, their suppliers based in Germany or other countries for their sub suppliers because the reach is not only limited to tier one. In that way, it has a broader outreach than the other acts because it obligates the businesses, Norwegian businesses, to uh, get in information about the full supply chain. In that way, it has a very broad outreach. Mm -hmm. And so to, to sum up, Tone, so a, a German headquartered company, for instance, that also has a Norwegian subsidiary with tax liability in Norway that also is above the, the thresholds named in the, named in the law, that would be also falling or be covered by the Norwegian law, but only for the scope of the Norwegian subsidiary. So the suppliers of that subsidiary and the business area of that subsidiary. Is, is, that, is that a correct summary? That is correct summary, Harald. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> Great, then I think we can um, take a step into the core agenda point, and that is um, really looking at the, the legal requirements uh, of the law um, and how these can be actually implemented in, in practice and, and what strategies uh, we recommend and we see um, both in general, but also for a software-based implementation. I also see already some first questions coming in. Um, uh, please feel free to, 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 to ask any questions that come up. We will get to them then at the end of the, the, the webinar. But yeah, jumping in and handing back to you, Tone, can you give us an overview of what the duty to carry out due diligence actually encompasses? Yes, uh, human rights to diligence is the core of the Norwegian Transparency Act. And we have now touched upon some of the aspects that make the Norwegian Transparency Act red, white, and blue, if you want to say so, uh, which means that it has a broader definitions in some sort. But the core obligation, the human rights to diligence process is based on the international frameworks. So uh, the Norwegian Transparency Act, it legislates um, the obligation to use and incorporate the USAID guidelines for multinational enterprises. The USAID guidelines uh, corresponds with the UN guiding principles and on business and human rights, which rests upon the three statutes of protect, uh, respect, and remedy. And the same kind of methodology uh, is found in uh, the human rights diligence process. And it is a process of uh, six steps, um, which are built on top of each other. And it is a dynamic process. It means that you continuously need to improve your human rights to diligence and continually need to update your human rights to diligence, depending on how your business evolves of how your risk picture is being altered. 
in its essence, these six steps are a um, recipe on how you can ensure respect for fundamental human rights and decent working conditions. And I think that is the reason why we are so fond of mm -hmm. this act, because it gives you this um, governance tool in order to target inherent risk of the company, because in, in its essence, all enterprises, no matter the size, no matter the, the broad of your supply chain, you will have inherent human rights and labor rights risk. Hmm. And as we will see, we will now dig into the different steps. This methodology might be known to some of you already, because this is the methodology we already use when we work with compliance. It's a risk-based approach. Uh, so our uh, message to enterprises is to take human rights to diligence, but also look at what you already have, meaning the compliance structure that you already have in your company, because to have guidelines in place, setting out the ambitions of the company, but also uh, the notions of the company, many companies always uh, already have this, for example, on anti-corruption. Hmm. And this can be built upon. But what we need to, to say before we dive now into the different steps, because we want to dive into the steps by the way of talking about the steps, but also showing how you can use software implementation, is to mention again these fundamental principles. And why is that important? I said just now that all companies will have an inherent human rights risk. All companies can map out that maybe they are in risk of violating a fundamental uh, right to freedom of association or organization, but how do you manage this risk so that it is proportional to your company and that it doesn't become overwhelming. Um, the very solution to doing so and to not get completely lost in the forest when you're doing your human rights due diligence is to follow strictly and use the principle of proportionality and the risk-based approach. The principle of proportionality means that the work that you're carrying out, the amount of human rights due diligence must correspond with the size of your company, but also the identified risk. And this goes hand in hand with the risk-based approach. It means that you have to focus on your highest risk. You may have mapped out multiple different risk areas, maybe multiple different countries that you need to focus on, but in order to carry out the human rights due diligence in a sufficient manner and an effective manner, you need to target the ones where your risk is highest. Mm -hmm. and by using these principles, you might also uh, see that your actions will actually have effect because you prioritize the areas where the risks are the highest and where the company actually might do some effective measures. Exactly. All right. And another way to, to look at this chart that we just saw with the various due diligence obligations is also to look at it as um, the due diligence cycle. Yeah? And the due diligence cycle uh, also applies very similarly uh, across the various legislations that are now either already passed or soon to be passed, um, you first have uh, the requirement to identify and assess risks. So find where either actual risks uh, and actual adverse impacts already occurred or where there's high potential for risk. And then you need to assess and assessing with this principle of, of proportionality, meaning where to focus to then lead into the measures. And, and uh, we can see here that risk assessment, risk identification, risk analysis, these all follow uh, the various paragraphs of, of uh, the laws in Norway on the European Union directive and in Germany, then to lead into the implementation and planning of suitable measures to mitigate and respond to those risks and adverse impacts that were identified. And then to eventually report uh, to authorities, oftentimes also publicly, the Norwegian law is, uh, as the name already says, um, extremely at the forefront of, of, of bringing transparency also to the public domain. And we will talk about that also during upcoming slides. But fundamentally, um, the functionality required and the processes required are really similar. And this is also what, what we as, as Prewave have been working on. So we already spent uh, the last years 
um, developing specific features and functionalities to support our customers along this due diligence cycle. We have various tools and we will, we will get into them to help our customers identify risks at suppliers, also to identify the whole supply chain. Um, so to uncover the second and third tier and beyond, then to assess and prioritize among those identified risks, to plan and implement actions, um, and then to report uh, according to the various guidelines and standards as they are presented in the law. And we are doing this now for around 100 companies under the German uh, Supply Chain Act. These are very large companies like uh, Volkswagen, uh, BMW, Lufthansa Group, uh, Dr. Oetker, so from various industries. But we also work with uh, a lot of small or medium-sized uh, companies. And of course, the scale is bigger, uh, but the fundamental processes and the support that's needed is similar. And with that sort of introduction, I now hand back to Tone and Nora to uh, give us the first introduction into the legal requirements, uh, starting with the responsible business conduct and how they can be embedded into the enterprise's uh, policies. Thank you, Harald. Um, the first step uh, of the due diligence process is to embed um, responsible business conduct in the, um, into the company's own policies. And this is important to um, practice the tone from the top principle, meaning that the responsibility for ensuring the, that the due diligence are performed and to ensure respect for fundamental human rights and decent labor conditions are clearly placed at the top of the company. And also that everyone involved in performing this due diligence process knows what they have to do. Mm. And this setting the tone from the top is, of course, also important in order to, to, to hold the company responsible, not only the company and, and the board and the management, but also the employees and also uh, customers of the company and suppliers of the company. And in that way, uh, society will also be able to hold the company responsible, but it also is a, a two-way street uh, mm. because you're responding to the expectations of the broader community as a whole when it comes to business and human rights. Mm -hmm. Right. This is the first step. That was the first step of the due diligence process. We're going to go through each step. We're now at the, the second step. So you start with embedding responsible business conduct in your enterprise, meaning setting out a tone from the top. When you have done so, and it might lead to changes in your guidelines, you need to do the risk assessment. Why? It means that in, in order to target the risk that uh, you inherently have in your company and also to set the tone from the top, you need to know what your risks are. You need to have knowledge in order to, to, to uh, attack or target the risk at hand. So the first um, step that you have to make is to identify the inherent human rights risk and the labor risk of your company. In many ways, this is a desktop exercise that has to be done by your ESG or your compliance department, looking at available public sources. Uh, the first um, identification that you can use is, of course, uh, which uh, branch you're in, different branches. For example, the textile industry will have a different risk picture than the consultant industry or the bank industry, which in that way will give you the first step. You can also, of course, look at country risk, and you can look, look at your partnership risk, meaning which countries do I operate in, which countries do I have suppliers in, and which kind of companies do I normally operate with. And as we said, for the Norwegian Transparency Act, it's not only a question of identifying your tier one supplier and your tier one where are they located or where what are they doing. You have to identify the risk in your complete supply chain, meaning it's not limited to tier one. It has to go all the way down to the production site. Uh, and this, as I said, this is in many ways uh, a desktop 
exercise where you have to gather publicly available information, but also information from your suppliers, maybe your employers that are working directly with uh, the areas in your company where your risk is highest. Uh, but there's also an identification process where we see that software platforms can play a crucial role in helping companies to actually identify the risk. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Absolutely. And, and, and the reason for that being is that this is really a, a step that already opens up a lot of complexity. Yeah, it, 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 it also then uh, means which approaches you choose and which methodologies you choose to carry out this initial identification and, and assessment of risks. And the selection of the approach can have a significant impact on the effort and the efficiency uh, of the approach that, that is behind it. Um, with the added complexity of then having an approach that is also possible for the entire supply chain and not just for the first tier of suppliers, which again can quickly, even for smaller companies, get into the hundreds of thousands of suppliers uh, that need to be assessed uh, according to those human rights uh, risks that are laid out in the, in the law. Now, uh, before I highlight um, or go into these different approaches, one other uh, point to highlight is that the law is very careful uh, around the risk assessment and also the measures to always differentiate between actual and potential adverse impacts. And this is a, a clear differentiation. Actual adverse impacts meaning problems that have already occurred that you are made aware of uh, through some or other channels and that need to be remediated or seized. Versus potential uh, adverse impacts, this is more where we speak about risk, the risk for potential adverse impacts. And again, uh, the assessment should cover uh, or look at both of, of those uh, topics. Now, um, what our approaches, uh, Tony already mentioned, uh, country industry risks is definitely a good uh, starting point yeah, to get a first understanding of your uh, risk map. Yeah, where do you have um, certain risk areas, certain risk suppliers? Um, but it's also in and of itself not the complete picture. It's part of the, uh, the approach, but it's not the complete picture. Um, on the one hand, um, this approach is, of course, not suited to identify actual adverse impacts. You, know, you can only identify high-level potential risks on a country level, on an industry level. A supplier in the textile industry in India would have obviously higher risk for human rights uh, uh, adverse impacts than a legal services provider in Norway. Yeah, but again, we are not yet looking with this approach on the actual adverse impacts. Um, and on the other side, um, an approach that's also typically used or that comes to mind is supplier self-assessments. And they are also a great, let's say, tool in the toolbox. Um, but they, of course, involve the supplier. This is when you actually need your supplier to, to answer, um, which again brings, uh, especially if you are dealing with uh, a broader number of suppliers, hundreds, a significant effort because not all of them will answer correctly or immediately. Um, the supplier self-assessment approach, of course, also is not one that applies or that is actually doable for the second or third tier suppliers because you don't actually have a direct business relationship with them. So sending self-assessments to your third tier suppliers is really out of the question. And it's also not a way to identify actual adverse impacts. It's more a way to understand the maturity um, and the standards and policies at, at your suppliers. So um, uh, having, having given a quick overview of these more traditional approaches, um, now uh, taking a look at the approaches that, that Prewave uh, brings to the table and that we've been successfully employing with our customers uh, for the German Supply Chain Act and others. Uh, the foundation, um, and this is, uh, I will go into the, the complete picture, but this is the foundation, which is also the history of Prewave as a company. So we are founded uh, based on uh, PhD research at the University of Technology Vienna, where we developed artificial intelligence technologies to actually screen and monitor publicly available media data in more than 50 languages in order to uncover, based on media monitoring in both news media, blogs, but also social media, um, actual adverse impacts, actual, we call them risk alerts, 
at your suppliers. And this, of course, is an approach that does not involve the supplier and therefore works for the whole supply chain. And you can employ this for a direct first tier supplier all the way down to the mine or raw material level to understand are there citizens complaining about air pollution? Are workers complaining about working conditions? Have labor rights been violated? So this is really an, an way that because it's based on artificial intelligence is also very automated and can apply to hundreds of thousands of um, suppliers very efficiently. Um, in order to give a complete picture to the risk assessment, um, uh, media, of course, is, is an, one important part of it. Yeah? Is, are there any known uh, postings or issues that can be uncovered based on uh, public media data? And oftentimes, yes, in the very local sources. So in the Indonesian social media channels, in Indonesian language. But this is also just one component of the complete 360 degree uh, assessment that we employ at Prewave. A second very important part of the component is the country, industry, and commodity risk evaluation. Uh, and this is where we use um, standardized indices on a country level, indices that cover the various topics of uh, the legislations. I can quickly highlight, um, because I also saw a question here already, which indices uh, we are using Basically, these are various indices published by NGOs or governmental authorities that are covering the various aspects of human rights or workplace uh, standard related topics uh, for forced labor and modern slavery. We're using the global, global slavery index for child exploitation. We're using the UNICEF children's rights in the workplace index for labor rights. We're using the IT, ITUC global rights index. And these are country based indices. And they then map against the topics of the various laws. For instance, the Norwegian law um, does not focus, um, and this is actually a deviation from the German one. The German one focuses also specifically on environmental topics like mercury, toxication, or persistent pollutants. This is not part of the Norwegian law. Therefore, the risk assessment uh, under the Norwegian Transparency Act does not include those indices, but we have them available. And this is also a list we will share um, as a follow-up um, uh, to this webinar. And then uh, by combining the media risk with the country and industry risk, uh, we have a much more complete picture of, yes, this is a supplier in a risk country or risk industry, but were there any known actual address impacts already based on media data? And based on that, we can calculate a first score, a first scorecard. And this scorecard, again, is completely independent of input from the supplier. As a third step, we then can include also assessments, so results from questionnaires, uh, from audits, or other types of assessment standards uh, that you might already be using into this evaluation. That might be available only for some of the suppliers, but then it can also be included for some of the suppliers. And we work as a fourth component with what we call external risk data. Now, this is external from the previous perspective. This is also quite an important component because here our customers can also add their own internal evaluations. Have they been made aware of issues at the supplier through internal audits? Have they received grievance reports around issues uh, at the supplier that are non-public? Those can also be added to this 360 degree uh, evaluation. And this really gives us a, a complete um, picture of the supplier. And we will go into the uh, next part soon where we show how we can then use this information to arrive at a really um, proportional and risk-based um, evaluation of the, of the suppliers. Before we do that, I want to touch on one other point, um, one crucial point, and that is um, this focus on the complete supply chain. So not just the first tier suppliers, which of course are known, and um, these are the ones that our customers either provide us in the form of a spreadsheet, um, if with their suppliers listed, um, but they don't have the second and third tiers in, 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 in most circumstances. Um, and there we actually can also employ an integrated approach. We call this supply chain mapping to actually uncover and bring this transparency to the complete uh, supply chain. This is an approach we've been also building up over the last years working with many of our large customers in the automotive industry, in the food and beverage industry, 
and others, we start off by using, just as we do for the risk identification, public data. Um, because we also see that the approach of simply asking all of your suppliers uh, with a blank piece of paper, what are their um, tier 2s, uh, what are your tier 2s, what are their suppliers, um, is an approach that's not working uh, on, a, on a broad base. So we need to also leverage public data. And the good thing is that there are actually various data sources um, that we can leverage uh, around bringing this transparency into the complete supply chain. One of them is media data. This is where we use our same our AI based technology to identify media risks to actually find um, supplier customer relationships. And the other data source is customs data around 30 countries in the world actually publishing cross border shipments, among them the United States, uh, Mexico, India, Russia, and many others. And this is also a data set that we can use to, to, bring, this, uh, to bring this transparency. Um, and by bringing those two parts together, we can then extend the risk assessment also into the deeper parts of the supply chain. But now uh, back to you, Tone, uh, to focus on the assess part of this requirement. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Haral. And it's very, very useful to see how actually Prewave can use software in order to make a desktop exercise of identifying human rights risk mm -hmm. a little bit easier for companies. So how do we assess that risk? What is a legal requirement for doing so? Mm -hmm. well, now you have identified the risk and you might have identified a lot of risk and it might be a bit overwhelming. So the next step um, is to assess um, the actual and potential adverse impacts on fundamental human rights and decent working con conditions that the enterprise are, um, has either caused or uh, contributed to. So this is about um, using the risk-based approach to prioritize the most serious risks identified for people, society, and environment. Mm -hmm. And it's about forming an overall risk picture first, and then pri prioritize the risk areas for more throughout mapping and measures. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, it's about assessing how the company is, is involved in negative impact in order to determine what kind of actions to implement. Mm -hmm. And here it's also important with the stakeholder involvement when you have identified actual neg negative impact. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. I'm going into the, the actual implementation um, that we employ at Prevate. And this is now where we employ these, these, these um, terms that were mentioned by Benora and, and, and Tone several times um, and that are also highlighted in, 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 in the law these principles of, of proportionality and the risk-based approach, because yes, we need a way to, to focus, yeah? uh, especially if you're looking also at the complete supply chain. And that's why we apply what we call a funnel approach that is primarily based on publicly available data and automated processing um, that takes us through this funnel and starts increasingly focusing on the suppliers with elevated risks and then the high risk and critical risk suppliers where we actually want to focus with the most uh, intensive measures. Um, how do we do that? As a first step, um, we get the first tier suppliers into the system, typically based on some Excel upload, can also be an integration with the sourcing systems of our customers. But then we have the first tier suppliers in the system. We then use our mapping, uh, supply chain mapping technology to expand into the second and third tier in a, a focused manner, happy to go into this in the Q&A section, because it's important to focus, to not get too many uh, tier two and tier three and, and, and beyond suppliers. And then we run them as a first step to the country and industry risk analysis. Also, uh, we can look at risk commodities, basically giving a first evaluation and more or less eliminating the non-risk suppliers. Those suppliers that are clearly not in risk countries, industries, like the Norwegian law firms, for instance, those are uh, not in this uh, next step then of suppliers with some risk. Here we continue with suppliers that are in a risk country or a risk industry or risk commodity to then apply on those suppliers the 360 degree scoring approach. And this is then this second uh, filter or hurdle in, in the funnel, uh, however you want to call it. But here we then apply the media screening 
So each of those suppliers with some risk, we screen based on five to 10 years of media data to identify what has happened at that supplier and to complete the, the first scorecard based on this combination of country risk, industry risk and commodity risk, which is based on indices and, 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 and uh, more statistical information that I just showed you earlier with the actual picture on the supplier um, based, for instance, then on the media screening or certain assessments and customer internal information that's already available. And this gives us a nice focus. Um, to show a quick um, a jump into the system, how does this then look like in the system in practice? So the key um, visualization we employ here is uh, the risk matrix. And uh, the risk matrix is the tool we use to then visualize hundreds, thousands of suppliers, tier one, tier N suppliers in a risk impact approach. And this is precisely where the principle of proportionality then uh, comes into play. Because on the X axis, we show suppliers with significant risk, for instance, because they're in a risk country, risk industry and had uh, previous issues. And on the Y axis, we look at the influence that uh, you as a customer have on your suppliers. And this is where the proportionality comes in because due diligence is always based on not just where you identify risk, but where do you have influence to actually change those risks and to mitigate those um, potential adverse impacts. Um, and this is what this uh, risk matrix shows because in the, in the top right then, we highlight those suppliers where there's both risk and influence. And this is then what determines here uh, the red, uh, dark red, light red, yellow, which is what we call the action priority. And for each supplier down here below, we calculate this action priority, meaning you should then focus your actions on those suppliers with a high or critical action priority. And uh, this, let's say, scorecard and scoring system is completely interactive. So you can actually dig into the various uh, topics um, you can dig into why does Borealis in Antwerpen now have a score of 34 in human rights? Well, because they have been involved in um, modern slavery uh, situation with one of the construction sites uh, in, in the Netherlands, uh, in Belgium recently. Um, and this is then precisely this tool that we then use to feed into the next step, um, which we now get into, which is the, the definition of, of measures. And with that, I handed the uh, Back to you, Antoine and Nora. <clears throat> so we now arrived at the, the third step of the human rights due diligence, uh, the risk assessment and identification and assessing where to prioritize is of course crucial to undertake before you arrive at the third step, because at the third step, you're in the phase of actually implementing suitable measures in order to know what is suitable, you know, you need to know where uh, your risk is highest, and you need to know where you can actually have an impact, as Harald just says. And the measures that you are to place uh, into effect is either measures that can seize, prevent, or mitigate the adverse impacts that you have now identified in step two. This means that this, the measures that you implement need to be um, linked to the level of risk that you have identified, the specific risk. Maybe it's uh, a risk of child labor, or maybe it's a risk of freedom of association, which will then inquire you to put into place different form of measures. But the obligation is to then follow up the risk that you have identified in your step two with suitable measures in step three. Mm -hmm. And the way this is then realized in the system is that precisely on this risk evaluation of an individual supplier, considering on the one hand the potential uh, adverse impacts, which is the action priority, and the actual adverse impacts, which is uh, the alerts. For instance, here we have five actual red flag alerts around this topic of forced labor and modern slavery. That then leads us into the action planning uh, module of the system, where we then have a view into, on the one hand, which actions were already performed with those suppliers and which actions are then recommended as a next step with these suppliers. And this is what you see here. We have uh, 3M in the US where we see the last actions were a basic and detailed self-assessment that were sent uh, through the pre system. 
Um, and here we have a supplier where certain follow-up actions are recommended. These are then actions on the one hand uh, to remediate actual adverse impacts. So in this case, to remediate a case of lawsuit and sexual wrongdoing at this supplier, the system recommends to send a statement to the supplier, which can be done directly through the system, and to also further elaborate on the uh, human rights and health and safety risks that are identified here, the system recommends a detailed self-assessment that can also be sent through the system. We provide a standardized set of questionnaires that are focusing on each of the topics uh, mentioned in the law, human rights, health and safety, labor standards, working conditions, and, and, and so on. <clears throat> Well, uh, excellent. So now uh, we have uh, step one, two, three. We have implemented suitable measures, which needs to correspond to the risk that you have identified. Mm. And now we jump to, to step four, which is tracking. Mm. And this next step is about uh, track the implementation and results of measures pursuant to the um, implementation of measures you've actually done. So it's about ensuring that the company uh, companies' actions do actually have effect, and to do so, the company needs to have enough information to ensure that the uh, uh, implementation does have effect. Mm -hmm. This is precisely how we work in Prewave with the system of the action planner, where you can uh, plan actions, but then also can implement them. You can track the status of the various actions: are they in progress? Are they already done? And you can then also add uh, to each individual action, for instance, here to this human rights and labor questionnaire that was sent out also additional documents, you can add comments, you can assign these actions also internally to really carry out this process of following up with actions uh, and documenting the implementation, uh, tracking and documenting the implementation and status of the various actions. Uh, and in its essence, Harald, then the Prewave platform it gives you a software solution to do your risk prioritization, also gives you a tool to implement low threshold measures and also to track the implementation of measures you have conducted. And in its essence, these are, are steps uh, that are crucial to your human rights diligence and which also forms the basis of the annual account that you have to um, produce under the Norwegian Transparency Act. I saw that we had a, a question of what, what does transparency actually means. And in the Norwegian Transparency Act, that translates into an obligation to publish an annual report on what kind of efforts you have undertaken for your human rights to diligence and uh, information requests. This means that everybody in society, be it civil society, journalist, or a consumer can pose a question to you as a company on how you are working on human rights to diligence or mitigating a specific risk or how your product is developed. And the first transparency obligation is to publish this annual account, which in its essence means that you need to provide information about your company, your operations, what kind of business you are doing, setting the frame for the risk picture of the company, and then inform on your human rights due diligence processes and as a supplement, the identified risk picture. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, then, let's say, where everything comes together um, when you are using a software-based approach where you're both carrying out the initial risk assessment, but then also tracking and implementing the measures using that system that you can then have also out of this one uh, single source of truth, a report generated that can form the foundation for this annual account. And we are currently in the final stages of preparing such a report. You can see uh, the current draft of this report on the right hand side here. Um, and this report again just covers the uh, three um, main topics or requirements that are mentioned in the law. On the one hand, a quick overview of the um, structure of the enterprise and the area of operations. We can, for instance, based on the data we have in the system, highlight 
how many suppliers there are in the system, in which industries, in which country they are situated, just to give a broad statistical overview of the types of operations of the business. Um, but then in section B, uh, which is then focused on which adverse impacts, either actual or potential, were identified, we can actually draw then on the information that's in the system. So how many red flag alerts have we found in the reporting period on your suppliers? Have there been any of these severe adverse impacts, uh, actual adverse impacts identified? And we can then report them uh, basically as a, as a count. Yeah? There's no requirement to outline specifically at which supplier, but just to give a broad indication of the number uh, of risks identified in, in which area. And based on the measures that are then tracked in the system, we can then also provide the corresponding information on which types of measures uh, the particular company was, was using and the number of those measures that were during this reporting period planned and already implemented. And this is then, let's say, really a, a very powerful way of giving a um, yeah, clear basis then also for the, the uh, annual account uh, as part of this section 5.1 uh, requirement. And last but not least, uh, Tone, the right to information. <clears throat> Yes, there is a transparency request information. Yeah, and this is the last uh, part of the due diligence process. Uh, and this is also an expression of the transparency uh, principle, meaning that any person um, might send a written request to the company requesting information about how the company handles it, uh, its um, human rights and labor rights risk in its supply chain. And the answer the company is obliged to give depends on the assessment made and the proportionality principle, meaning that the answer should be proportionate. Yes, yes. Um, I think to, we would like to, to sum it up a little bit, maybe Harald. So we have time for, for a few questions at the end. Um, as we, we said time and again, uh, the Norwegian version of business and human rights, it builds on the international frameworks. The international frameworks have made this methodology of human rights diligence. And the steps that we have gone through now is inherently linked to each other. If you do not carry out, for example, step two, and to carry out a proper risk assessment where you have also identified and you have prioritized your risk and you have knowledge of where your risk is highest, you will not be able to implement suitable measures, both because it's not targeted to the risk at hand, because different risk requires different measures, but it was, uh, will also, in many cases, leave you lost in the forest because you're not targeting your measures and it will overwhelm your compliance department if you are to implement uh, measures equally to all suppliers through your entire supply chain. Because in its essence, the Norwegian version of business and human rights is uh, have the joker of um, establishing the requirement of the entire supply chain. We've said it time and again, this is different from different legislation that we find in Germany, that we also find now at the table at the EU Parliament, but also when it comes to the Modern Slavery Act in the UK, UK and in France. The Norway have taken the, the broad approach of targeting the entire supply chain. And that, that is why the, the governing principles of the Norwegian Transparency Act, meaning the principle of proportionality, the principle of a risk-based approach becomes even more important. And of course, also in order to adhere to the transparency requirements. Hmm. And as we've seen, the um, pre-wave platform um, do provide really helpful tools to do this due diligence process to do the risk analysis and to prioritize the most important risk to, mon to implement uh, sufficient measures and to monitor the measures uh, that you have implemented. Mm -hmm. And we find it very exciting, Harald, that we have such software and that we can benefit from artificial intelligence in order to target in a more effective way human rights risk to the benefit of us all. Huh? <laughs>
Well, thank you, thank you so much, Tony and Nora, also for this for this great summary and 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 your inputs during this webinar. Yeah, um, it was also a pleasure working with you so far on on also finding still the the gaps that are in the previous system, yeah, and and really making our solution ready for the Norwegian uh, Transparency Act, which is really very important and at the forefront. Uh, we have a few minutes left, and actually, I think both both Nora, Tone, and myself, we can go a little bit over time, uh, but we will try to tackle as many questions as we as we can now. Um, I will pass the first one uh, to you, Tone and Nora, which is, I think there's two questions, again, around the applicability to foreign companies. So somebody is asking a question uh, that they have, uh, that they are a foreign company, um, they have 50, more than 50 employees abroad, mm -hmm. not in Norway. Uh, does this mean they fall under the act in Norway or, or not? Uh, this is the question by uh, Mr. Reich at, at ask at, at 10, 20 o'clock. <clears throat> Well, the, the core criterion and that you would need to trace back and double check is whether or not this foreign company, which I presume then maybe is a Norwegian subsidiary, even though the employers are not based in Norway, is tax liable to Norway. In the event that this subsidiary is tax liable to Norway due to the fact that the economical activities if is in Norway, then yes, the company would fall under the scope of the act if you meet the thresholds in the act. Mm -hmm. So this also applies, I see in the uh, second question that goes into the similar direction. Um, I'm selling a product into the Norwegian market, but do not have an office in Norway. Um, again, if this activity in the Norwegian market leads to a, a tax liability, uh, then yes, right, potentially, uh, but but if there's no tax liability in Norway, then this would also be a clear indication that you do not fall under the uh, requirements of the law. Is, is that correct? That is correct. The Norwegian Transparency Act is a Norwegian uh, law that applies to Norwegian companies and those companies that are tax liable to Norway. Uh, so it is a desktop exercise done with uh, maybe your in-house tax lawyers that can check whether or not you're tax liable to Norway. Not all companies that provide services to the Norwegian market are tax liable to Norway. Perfect. Um, there's one more question, which I think is, is also best answered by you. Uh, and that is, how extensive should this annual account be that also needs to be published publicly on the website? Um, is this expected to be a 50 to 100 page document? Or is it also expected to be a much shorter, more high level document giving a very general overview? Do you have any guidance or ideas on that? Well, I can say already now that it's not expected to be 50 to 100 pages. Norwegian companies, we, we write short when we make an annual account. Um, the, the reporting obligation is an overall overview over how your company operates. As I said, setting the, the picture of the business operations of the company, a general description of your human rights to diligence process, meaning what kind of measures have your company set into place that may mirrors the operations of your company and the risk identified, which means that the third part is that you need to report on the risk identified. And this is somewhat new in the Transparency Act, meaning that you not only have to report on what kind of measures you have done, but also the risk identified within your business operation, but also your supply chain. Mm. This reporting obligation and, and what we have seen is that most Norwegian companies will, will keep this brief, uh, but they will have to report on these three criterions. Uh, and in addition to putting it in your annual account, you need to make it publicly available, meaning on your homepage. Uh, and one of our um, notions uh, is often that the Norwegian Transparency Act should be seen in the context of sustainability or ESG in full, meaning that the Norwegian Transparency Act is in its course core social sustainability. And many companies then include reporting on the Norwegian Transparency Act within the scope of sustainability work of the company and compliance work of the company. But um, in some, no, it doesn't require 50 to 100 pages, but you need to report on what is required under the act. Excellent. Um, 
uh, it's currently 11 o'clock. Um, we will, uh, what we will do is summarize some of the questions and also where we can answer them in writing and submit them as part of the follow-up mailing. There are many questions related to pre-wave itself and uh, they can clearly be, be answered uh, by, by myself as well. Um, but uh, we can maybe take five more minutes to, to answer some of the, the themes or questions that are uh, uh, reoccurring. Um, I will quickly go through some of these questions um, that are more related towards pre-wave, by which means are the thresholds set uh, prioritized from low, medium, high, critical? Um, that is actually, um, let's say, a, a standard um, classification that we bring uh, to projects where we have um, risks that are clearly mentioned in the law, such as child labor, um, they are uh, prioritized on a critical basis, also based on the severity uh, and the, um, let's say, impact of, of, of those um, risks that they have in general. But this can be also customized, and we typically do customize this together with customers, particularly if they're working in specific areas where it needs to happen. Another question I saw is uh, a question around stakeholder engagement. So do we as Prewave offer stakeholder engagement, which is also clearly uh, mentioned in, uh, in, the, in the law? And yes, we do. We actually have partners um, available, uh, the Rainforest uh, Foundation in, in, in Norway uh, is one of them, uh, but we also have other human rights uh, consultants as partners that we work with, for instance, already on the German law. And they are then experts on local situations that can um, facilitate this, this stakeholder engagement um, as part of, of then uh, measures uh, that are implemented towards risks that are identified. I also saw a question, um, self-assessments are really not the right way to mitigate actual adverse impacts. And I completely agree. We separate in the system between what we call preventive measures so measures that are more towards reducing risk uh, and measures that are actual um, mitigation measures uh, for risks or impacts that have already happened. And, and a self-assessment is clearly not the one for the remediation. For that, we can have remedial on-site audits. We would typically provide corrective action planning in cooperation uh, with the supplier, where we allow them for this interaction also with the supplier uh, on, the, on the platform. Um, I saw one other question, maybe, um, which was asked again to you, Tone, regarding the tax liability. Does this also include sales tax liability in Norway, or is this uh, not a question that can be answered that, that easily? <clears throat> um, maybe we can we can follow up on this question. Mm -hmm. But my understanding right now is yes, that will also be included. It's a question of tax liability in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to, to add on, you know, uh, Harald, the, the pre-wave platform is a, is a tool for ensuring compliance and it helps you navigate um, the, the road of human rights due diligence. And it also gives you um, uh, a set of, of tools in order to set out which measures to, to set out. But if you have, of course, a high risk supplier, you would also need to supplement the solutions uh, with, for example, uh, an on-site audit. And here, um, Prewell will can help you facilitate putting into place those kind of actions. But it will, of course, also, um, when you're dealing in a high-risk operations or with a high-risk supplier, it will also require your company to conduct your own assessments and to follow up on these measures. Hmm. This is, I can exactly agree. Prewell does not... Prewave provides some tools for carrying out more digital uh, actions, yeah. Um, but of course, we are not auditors, and we do not travel to factories to audit. But we have actually a network of what we call action partners, uh, some of the largest accreditation, certification, auditing bodies worldwide, that can then be used to facilitate audits, and then again bring back the results of these audits into the Prewave platform. But this is again where at some point we work with with partners as well. Mm. Um, I also see the question whether we align the self-assessment questionnaires with with a particular standard. We of course do align them with the standards that are also underneath the legislation, such as the OECD guidelines uh, and the UNGPs. Um, uh, the self-assessment questionnaires that we offer 
are very standardized in the sense that they ask towards certifications and available policies in the various areas. And then we have more detailed self-assessments that can then also be used as the foundation of what we call a desk audit, you know, where again, a partner or sometimes an internal person from the customer would then actually rate and grade the responses of the supplier on a more detailed level. But this is something that we, that we also offer. Um, do you see any other question, Tony or Nora, that uh, you feel like you can, you can answer or uh, do we continue with going uh, with the written answers and we call it a day for now? I think it's a very good um, uh, good way to follow up with, with written answers. There's a lot of very, very interesting questions posed. The last questions that I, that I just wanted to answer briefly is that um, in Norway and the Norwegian Transparency Act and with the backdrop of civil society being the one pushing for it and with um, information requests, which is very much consumer based, it is the consumer authority in Norway, which is the uh, regulatory body which follows up this act. Uh, it's also the governmental authority that will issue guidance on this act and they have issued new information and guidance on their homepage, uh, February, I think it was on 12 February or something. And most of the information is by now only in Norwegian, but information is also found on their English homepage. And in addition, in Norway, uh, the USD contact point is also working as a kind of advisory body to the act. So information can also be found on the USD contact point. Perfect, and uh, we will definitely link uh, to this page of the Consumer Authority with the various guidelines, which is available both in English and in Norwegian language as part of the follow-up mailing. And uh, with that, I want to thank, first of all, all of the attendees, but now particularly you, Tone and Nora, for uh, participating in this webinar and also supporting us, Prewave, in our journey in uh, supplying uh, and extending our solution to cover the requirements of the Norwegian Transparency Act. Um, we will also share uh, uh, the contact details of, of Tone and Nora. So in case you have any follow-up questions on, on legal matters, feel free to, to also contact them directly. And with that, I say thank you very much, everybody. And um, this might not have been the last, but actually the beginning of several webinars on the topic of the Norwegian Transparency Act. And, with that, I wish everybody uh, a great day. And also thank you, Nora and Tone, once more. Thank you so much, Harald. And uh, congratulations on the International Women's Day, everybody. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then have a good day, everybody. Thank you. <clears throat>